Good evening and welcome to Primetime News. I'm Sandro Ferdinando. And I'm Azra Hassan. Now before we head into our stories in detail, let's look at the headlines. No confidence motion against Minister Ravi Karuna Nayaka to be decided on Thursday. State Minister Lakshman Yapa says those accused of corruption must resign before the no confidence motion. CEO of Perpetual Treasuries Limited, Kasun Palisena, testifies before the Presidential Commission for the first time. Tensions break out at the North Central Provincial Council once again. Views were expressed in Parliament today on the motion of no confidence brought in by the Joint Opposition against Foreign Minister Ravi Karna Nayaka. A motion of no confidence signed by over 30 MPs of the joint opposition has been submitted, citing that the chamber has lost its faith over the conduct of the former finance minister and current foreign minister. It is essential that a debate on this motion is taken up immediately. I would like to ask what decision you have taken in this regard. We will discuss this matter as required and a decision will be announced on Thursday after a legal issue concerning this is resolved. Honourable Speaker, there is no way there could be a legal obstruction in taking up a no-confidence motion for debate. The matter is sub so I too will have to look into it. Honourable Prime Minister, Garo, Garo, Honourable Speaker, what are they asking us to do? Get the Foreign Minister to stage a fast opposite the UN office? Honourable Speaker, please tell the Prime Minister that this is the Parliament, not the Angoda Hospital. It is true that a matter which is being heard before a commission, which is similar to that of a judicial mechanism, cannot be discussed in Parliament. But the fundamental factor for this no-confidence motion is not the reason why this commission has been appointed. It has been appointed for an entirely different fraud. There is no need for these two matters to be intertwined. It is essential that the motion of no confidence which has been submitted is included in the agenda. Only then can it be debated whether this matter could be discussed or not. But you have not taken any measure to do so. It has not been included into the agenda because of the legal issue. I will create the opportunity for this. Honourable Speaker, the legal issue will arise based on whether this can be debated in Parliament or not. How can there be a legal issue over something which has not even been included into the agenda? A no-confidence motion has been submitted, so the first thing is to include it into the agenda. Once this is done, it can be decided whether or not it can be debated in Parliament. So you are seeking legal consultants over something which has not even been included into the agenda. Listen, this matter was discussed at the party leaders meeting this morning, which you did not attend. That is where it was decided that it would be looked into following which on Thursday I would announce a decision. That is the final decision. Convening a media briefing today, State Minister Lakshman Yapa Bevardhana commented on the no-confidence motion submitted against the Foreign Minister. It would be best for the government, the country and both the parties if those who have been accused take a decision before the no-confidence motion is tabled. There is no other way to stop this division without doing so. So this is a good lesson to all the politicians on how to maintain one's respect. You have to ask that from the president himself. All I can say is that the president will take a few important decisions within the next two weeks.
Never in Sri Lanka's history has a minister been brought in and directly questioned like this by the Attorney General's department. We have to admit that. The President has given a political backing to conduct these matters independently. Then we can move on to your second question. The recommendations given by this commission cannot be rejected or denied by anyone. The Janata Vimukti Peramuna at Media Briefing this morning also commented on the central bank bond scam. The law has not been enacted on the thieves behind the avant-garde incident. Its investigations have been delayed, so the legal measures will also take time. Then regarding the bond scam, there was an attempt within COPE to cover up the main dealer behind this, Arjuna Mahindran, and the political authority who used him to commit this scam. You cannot measure the gravity of thievery, saying that theft was just one onion ring, while this is much bigger. A theft is a theft. Basil is saying that we did not even have a cup of tea from our personal expenses. Then how was the mansion in Malwana built? It is clear that the theft of the Rajapaksa clan cannot be covered through the central bank bond scam. It is those who have such allegations against them who are bringing in no confidence motions. So it is a question of whether these people have the moral right to do so. This group has brought in a no confidence motion to show that the central bank bond scam is much bigger than the fraud that they committed themselves. <laughs> Throwing all the blame into Ravi Kanwanayaka in this investigation on the bond transaction will not work. The investigation has to date back to the 15th of January 2015 when the very first meeting at the finance ministry which was the outset of this fraud. The investigation has to start from Ravi Kanwanayaka who was the finance minister at the time the then Minister of Highways Kabir Hashim and then Central Bank Governor Arjuna Mahendran and Malik Samaravikrama who held no ministerial portfolio or position in the Central Bank at the time but just a representative of the United National Party, all of whom who took part in the discussion. If the telephone records of the footnote clan of the United National Party which was investigating this scam are investigated, it could easily be ascertained as to who maintained ties with Arjuna Mahendran and Arjuna Lawshis during that time frame. The investigation surrounding the Treasury bond issue was raised at several political discussions today. The individual named Sirivardhana from the Central Bank has testified before the Commission that the country is in a financial crisis because of the bond issue. This is the certificate issued to the government. On one side, there is a financial crisis and on the other, there is an economic crisis. The Prime Minister must be held responsible. The extracts from Arjun Aloysius's mobile phone have mentioned the Prime Minister's name as Honourable PM. That was not highlighted. There was a mention of an RK as well. This needs to be investigated. If I am summoned to speak on the complaint I made against the Prime Minister on this scam, I will be happy to testify before the Commission. Corruption of those in the previous regime were exposed. However, measures have not been taken to set up a Commission and file cases against those accountable. It is reported that they looted in the billions. We always speak of four people who killed people. They have not been brought before the law. That needs to be done first. Malik Samravikrama and Kabir Hashim, who took part in the meeting on the 27th of February 2015, and the committee of the Prime Minister's committee that was appointed, said that there was no bond scam. Those three people must be called upon and asked to prove how they determined that there was no scam. The hedging matter must be investigated and done with. There are two people responsible for bringing substandard petrol to the country. They must be investigated as well. All these allegations are against those who were with the Rajapaksa. Yet, no arrests have been made thus far. The government speaks of the Thajudin homicide, but nothing has happened. When asked about the land in Malwana, they say that they cannot remember. When asked about a murder, they say that they cannot remember. When a commission summoned one, he said that he was bitten by a snake. The other is Mahindananda Alutgama, who skimmed millions. Another is Udaya Gamanpila, who extorted money from an Australian couple. 
then there is the passport thief Vimal Veeravansa. These rogues are bringing a no-confidence motion. Whatever party they may represent, they do not deserve to be in parliament. They must leave. Minister of Housing and Construction Sajid Premadasa says the law will be implemented to all equally. Today there is no difference whether one belongs to the government or the opposition. Everyone is treated equally where the rule of law is supreme in the country. Justice is being meted out. There was a time when court orders were first taken at Temple Trees and the President's house before court issued its verdict. That was not good governance. It was the rule of the devil. We discarded all the policies of the devil rule. Today, there is the possibility to investigate allegations against individuals irrespective of whether they belong to the government or the opposition. That is the freedom that prevails in the country. The minister made this statement during an event to declare open the model village named Sadavira Senpati Aladinigama, which consists of 28 houses in Tissamahara, Mahamadhuta. The Chief Executive Officer of Perpetual Treasuries Limited, Kasun Palisena, testified before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry for the first time today. Zulfik Farzan reports on Bondgate. The evidence of Kasun Palisena was led by the attorney representing Perpetual Treasuries Limited, President's Counsel Nihal Fernando. Kasun Palisena, the CEO of Perpetual, had served at First Capital Money Workers Limited, Bartlett McLeod and Roy, Equity Securities Limited before joining Perpetual Treasuries Limited as a dealer and thereafter becoming the CEO of Perpetual Treasuries Limited. When he joined PTL, the board of directors of Perpetual comprised of Chairman Jeffrey Aloysius, Arjun Aloysius, Suren Mutraja, Godfrey Aloysius and Ranjan Hulgalla. One of the conditions mentioned in the business plan submitted to the central bank by Perpetual Treasuries was PTL will promote different techniques it learned in equity secondary market transactions for secondary bond market. Pali Sena said the buying and selling of shares for the Perpetual Group was done by Perpetual Asset Management and Perpetual Capital Holdings involving Arjun Aloysius and Suren Mutraja. Justice Prasanna Jayabardana, citing their allegations at the Columbus Stock Exchange in 2012, was concerned if those techniques were to be adopted. Pali Sena said PTL had submitted the business plan before his time. The starting capital of Perpetual Treasuries Limited was 310.3 million rupees, which was pumped by Perpetual Asset Management. Perpetual Treasuries Limited generated a profit of 816.6 million from the 1st of April 2014 to 30th of September 2014, which increased their capital to 1.1 billion rupees during that period, an increase of 400% of their initial capital. From 28th March 2014 to the 26th of February 2015, the total secondary market transactions by PTL were 276 billion 34 million of the face value of bonds, which mature at seven years or more, becoming a price maker. According to Palisena, the non bank price makers are Wealth Trust Securities Limited, First Capital Securities Limited, Perpetual Treasuries Limited, and Capital Alliance. The Chief Executive Officer of Perpetual Treasuries Limited, Kasun Palisena, will testify once again tomorrow before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry. Tomorrow he will testify in relation to the fund availability for Perpetual Treasuries Limited to bid on the controversial auction dated the 27th of February 2015. I'm Farzan for News First from the Presidential Commission of Inquiry. Sri Lanka free against corruption. The national anti-corruption drive spearheaded by News First continued its journey across the island today. Here are the views expressed by the public against corruption. It is not just this government. It has been happening all along. There is no point in finding fault now. Those who do wrong should not be allowed to raise their heads. We are the ones who make the same mistake over and over again. We always hope for something good to happen. We know that the previous government committed fraud. No one is denying that. All of them are doing this together. We have not been getting the Samruti benefit for several years now. It is difficult to determine as to which direction the country is moving towards. Today, it is difficult to judge who the corrupt are and who are not. Another phase of the campaign for a Sri Lanka free against corruption were in effect in the Anuradhapura and Ratnapura districts. Our teams educated the public while touring the Alapatha, Batugadara and Palmadula areas in the Ratnapura district. According to reports, though financial allocations were made for the renovation of the roads in the area, 
All work has been halted midway as the funds allocated have ended up as commissions to various individuals. It is better than the previous government, but the media reports that they steal as well. Look at the size of their houses. They are worth millions. There is so much they could do for the country with that money. All the shortcomings in villages must be shown for the ministers to open their eyes, but they never do. It is the poor people like us who always suffer. The thieves who were in the previous government are in this government too. Our daily wage is 500 rupees, but we have to pay 700 rupees in loans. I have never seen a parliament like this. Our teams also toured several settlements in the Anuradhapura district which are nourished by the Mahavilachya tank. Around 720 families in this area are battered by the severe drought that is affecting the country. Public representatives are going on overseas tours and traveling in luxury vehicles, but none of them look into the well-being of the people of this village. Just give us some water at least. Do those who took our vote not see us because they are fast asleep in all the comfort they have? Speaking at an event held in Amevala, Minister Palni Digambaran expressed the following views. The government will be in power until 2020. Some media institutions are using the elections to target the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has instructed us to hit back at the media if the media attacks us. So we will look into that. We are not scared of anyone. Remember that we will not simply stand by waiting for someone to hit us. Anybody who thinks this is dreaming. If we are hit, rest assured, we will hit back. Tempers flared at the North Central Provincial Council today as well when three points of order were submitted with regard to the appointment of the new chairman of the council. On the 18th of July, the chairman of the North Central Provincial Council, PMR Siripala, was ousted through a no-confidence motion and a new chairman was appointed. However, today, UPFA Provincial Councillor K. H. Nandasena submitted three points of order and cited that the removal of the former chairman was illegal. He had then addressed the incumbent chairman as the MP seated in the chairman's seat. Thereafter, PMR Siripala criticized the manner in which the Provincial Council functioned on the 18th of July. A heated situation was experienced at the council premises as opposition councillors and those representing the UPFA exchanged strong words. However, the new chairman did not pay attention to the views of the UPFA members and continued in accordance to the agenda of the day. UPFA members representing the joint opposition were seen wearing black pants and they set fire to the agenda papers given to them. UNP councillor Arunabuddhika responded by spraying water. The councillors representing the joint opposition thereafter left the premises, forcing the chair to adjourn sessions to the 22nd of August. The joint opposition members then engaged in a seated protest at the provincial council premises. An altercation that took place on the 18th of July when the no-confidence motion against TMR Siripala was presented took a turn for the worst. The mass of the council was damaged. UNP member D.M. Amaratunga took oaths as chairman instead of the former chairman. The North Central Provincial Council is made up of 33 members. 11 UNP members and one JVP member make up the opposition of the council. The ruling UPFA has 21 members of which 15 support the joint opposition. A conference was held in Colombo today on the eradication and controlling of international crime and terrorism in South and Southeast Asia. The conference was jointly organized by Interpol and Sri Lanka police. Are our law enforcement authorities, not merely the police, 
but the customs and the others are they updated so we still operate on structures left behind by the colonial uh, rulers so how do you bring the modernization into all your services while keeping its peculiar characteristics you can't merge the customs and the police that's not possible but the customs have to be modernized as much as the police is internally you must be modernized and these are the problems we have if you look at the immigration or the customs or the police or the court system or the legal system how do you eliminate these delays and in this i must say the minister and the police are now taking the initiative to bring new reforms to the police and a new law we have built a rank structure which is not reflected in the police ordinance that's how out of date we are terrorism goes has a direct correlation with uh, drugs and organized crimes terrorism needs money It needs loads and loads of money so the best way to find money drugs and arms there is no doubt that law enforcement agencies of all our countries have to make faster decisions at borders develop stronger coordination strategies and strengthen investigative and analytical skills to detect prevent and disrupt terrorists organize transnational crime networks and their affiliates a key fact in this context will be the need for police worldwide to have access to real time information on such transnational criminals and their affiliates and to enhance regional cooperation in the south and southeast asian region in this regard interpol stands as the global platform for such information exchange as reg- recognized by the united nations security council resolution 2178 in 2014 we collectively also grapple with some of the challenges that have emerged as a result of this increasingly interconnected world crime and terrorism are not new to us but they have thrived in an open and more connected world criminal and terrorist groups which were previously limited to specific countries or regions now have global reach and have come up with increasingly sophisticated ways to evade authorities carry out their activities including recruitment financing terrorism and crime the government of canada is committed to working with your respective countries to identify and address terrorist threats through this initiative and through other collaborative efforts In more local news, Pulonarua and Madhurigiri have been battered by the dry weather conditions. The adverse effect this drought has had on the Pulonarua district is evident from the state of the Parakrama Samudra. While many tanks in the area have suffered a similar fate, a large number of paddy fields have already been destroyed. The residents of these areas are also threatened by elephants which roam in search of food since food is scarce in the jungles. This is the damage elephants had caused yesterday in the Darshanapur area in Madhurigiri. Venerable Budangala Ananda Thero called on Jaffna High Court Judge M Ilan Chelian for a discussion last evening at the Jaffna High Court premises. Venerable Buddhangal Anand Thero praised the actions of Justice M Ilanchelian when his security officer was killed in a shooting recently. The Thero served in the Sri Lanka army until 2005 and thereafter took up robes. Command of the Security Force Headquarters Jaffna Major General Darshan Hetiarachi also attended the meeting. Venerable Buddhangal Anand Thero handed over a letter to Jaffna High Court Judge M Ilanchelian which contains the following. The air that we breathe has no race. The water that we drink has no race. The earth that we live in has no race. The sun rays do not have a race. Every free and independent nation faces a single moment in its history when it is confronted with a choice. Take a stand against corruption or continue to slide down a slippery path toward destruction. It is our belief that Sri Lanka today is at this crossroad we believe that the presidential commission of inquiry to investigate the bond scandal holds in its hands the power to shift sri lanka's post independence history
from one ravaged by corruption to one of progress and justice. The very decision to appoint this commission is surely Sri Lanka's first correct move against corruption. The Honourable Bench, the Attorney General's Department, including the Attorney General, the Auditor General and the Auditor General's Department conducting the bond investigations must be appreciated for their meticulous, honest hard work on behalf of the people. The malpractices, fraud and corruption committed even by previous regimes should not be forgotten. The verdict passed by a former Chief Justice over the helping Hambantota scam could easily be considered to be the first black mark to good governance in Sri Lanka's recent history. It was this black mark that resulted in a cascade of corruption leading up to what is today an international embarrassment. The president is here because of me. Recently I was at the public market. I went there even when I was a chief minister. I never had any guards. A member of the JVP tapped me on the back and spoke to me. He told me that I had the opportunity to put this man behind bars with just one sentence. I told him to please forgive me. I asked the entire nation to please forgive me. If I had put that man behind bars, we could have saved this country from a massive destruction. The Wazim Tajuddin homicide. On the 17th of May 2012, the charred remains of a rugby player, Wazim Tajuddin, was found in a car close to Shalika grounds in Narahempita. Even though this incident was initially claimed to be an accident, it was later confirmed that it was in fact a murder. Threats against journalists. In May 2008, defense journalist at the Nation newspaper Keith Neuer was abducted and brutally assaulted. On the 8th of May 2009, senior journalist Lasanta Vikramathunga was assassinated in Attidia. Within a span of two weeks since the murder of Lasanta Vikramathunga, the chief editor of the River newspaper Upali Tenukun was attacked by a group on two motorbikes. On the 1st of June 2009, journalist Podhala Jayantha was abducted from Nugegoda and inhumanely tortured. Attacks against media institutions. On the 6th of January 2009, the Depanama studio complex of the MTV MBC Media Network was attacked using Claymore explosives. On the 25th of March of the same year, the office of the Udayan newspaper in Jaffna was attacked with a hand grenade. On the 22nd of March 2010, the Sirasa head office is attacked again. Nearly four months after the attack on the Sirasa head office, the Voice of Asia network is attacked. Information came to light of a scandal of over six million US dollars in the purchasing of four MiG aircraft and the overhaul of three MiG-27 and one MiG-23 aircraft of the Sri Lanka Air Force in 2006. A letter in this regard addressed to the Defense Secretary Gotabe Rajapaksa by Ukrainian state-owned enterprise Ukraine Marsh was exposed by the media. The Misuse of State Funds and Property A case against former sports minister Mahindananda Alutkamage is underway over the purchasing of sports equipment using a sum of 53.5 million rupees belonging to the Department of Sports Development. Investigations are underway against MP Namal Rajapaksa under the Money Laundering Act over the misuse of 70 million rupees to organize a rugby tournament in 2013 under the guise that the funds were provided by a private company. Investigations are still underway against former Defense Secretary Gotabe Rajapaksa into the incident where money was allegedly deposited into the DA Rajapaksa Foundation. Yoshida Rajapaksa accused of misusing government funds to launch CSN. A court case against MP Johnston Fernando is still underway over financial fraud at Lak Satasa. The former First Lady Shiranti Rajapaksa over the misuse of public property and funds for the non-governmental organization Sirilia Savia. A court case against former Minister Basil Rajapaksa and Thirukumar Nadesan is underway regarding a 16-acre plot of land and a mansion in Malwana. 
Several allegations against former Minister Vimal Veerawansa, including the misuse of state vehicles and the possession of a fake passport. Garmani Senarath, the Chief of Staff of the former President. Former Chairman of the Telecommunications and Regulatory Commission of Sri Lanka, Anusha Palpita. Former Chairman of the Sri Lanka Ports Authority, Priyat Bandhu Vikrama. The former Monitoring MP during the former government, Sajin Divas Gunavardhana. Former Sri Lankan Ambassador to Russia, Udyanga Virathunga and the signing of an agreement for a steel manufacturing plant with Nandana Lokovitana for 15 years without a competitive clause, tax-free, are just some of the major allegations against the former government. The people believe in the honorable, just and strong bench, the Attorney General and the Auditor General and have complete faith that this process will be the beginning of the end to corruption in Sri Lanka. All we can hope for is the leadership to take our nation to a place where justice rules above all. Since our entire news bulletin is dedicated to reveal information on incidents of fraud and corruption that has plagued our nation, we are unable to report on protests which took place at several places on various issues. Therefore, if the day can be extended to 25 hours as mentioned by the Prime Minister, we can use that extra hour to report on those matters. And with that, wrap up primetime news. Thank you for joining. I'm Sandro Ferdinando. And I'm Azra Hassan. Take care and good night.